Russia has now halted a deal. It's been rumored for a while, but now it is halted. A deal that allows Ukraine to ship Ukraine's grain through Moscow's Black Sea blockade to the rest of the world. This is an agreement that helped feed much of the world and keep global food prices down. The suspension was not related to today's attack earlier that killed at least two people on the Kerch Bridge linking Russia with the peninsula of Crimea, which it annexed illegally in 2014. And joining me now is John Kirby, National Security Council Coordinator for Strategic Communications at the White House. So it's great to see you here. Let's talk first about, about the grain deal, how critical this is. So important, Andrea. More than 50 percent of the grain that was shipped out went to developing countries, Latin America, Asia, Africa, countries that really needed this grain. Um, and now there's going to be greater food insecurity as a result of this. And I'm really glad that in your opening you called it a blockade, because that's essentially what Russia is now putting back in place. A blockade on this grain will not be allowed to leave Ukraine, and they're not going to be able to ship it over land uh, through EU countries, at least not to the degree that they can by sea. Uh, so this could have devastating consequences for people living in developing countries that just want to eat. Uh, we're about to take over in August the presidency of the UN Security Council. Uh, Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield spoke about this very thing today. And while Russia plays political games, real people will suffer. The child in the Horn of Africa who is severely malnourished, the mother who will stop producing breast milk, breast milk for her baby because she doesn't have enough to eat herself. These are the consequences of Russia's actions. And she knows of what she speaks. She's been to those locations. Indeed She's she has. a hands-on ambassador. I'm going to be interviewing her tomorrow at the Aspen Security Conference. Uh, but um, this, does, this inf does this indicate that Turkey is losing its leverage? Turkey helped negotiate this deal with Russia. Well, I don't know that it indicates that they're losing leverage, and we're grateful for President Erdogan's uh, intervention here. He has kept this grain deal going now for a full year. It's gone through numerous extensions. Of course, the U.N. has done this, uh, and I know President Erdogan is none too happy either that uh, Russia has made this decision to, to pull out, but I really like the way the ambassador uh, characterized it there. I mean, it's going to have real practical impacts on real lives, real families, real children, and these are places in the world where, where food scarcity matters a lot. And this grain deal really helped uh, put food on the table for folks. And it will be Russia. And it needs to be remembered, particularly in those parts of the world, that Russia is the one who's turning off the spigot. Let's talk about the Kerch Bridge, which is the second attack. Uh, do you have any doubt as to who's responsible or any way of attributing it? Uh, we are not able to attribute it uh, to anyone in particular right now. Uh, this is the second time the bridge has come under attack. We know that the first attack was from Ukrainian forces. Uh, again, I wouldn't want to speculate on who exactly was, was responsible for this. But to be clear, Andrea, Crimea is Ukraine. Uh, it belongs to Ukraine. It doesn't belong to Russia. They have no business being there in the first place. And Ukraine has every right to pick the targets it wants to pick to defend itself and to try to reclaim its territory. Now, Ukraine has acknowledged that their military is running into fierce defense from yes. Russia in the counteroffensive. But you've got the le leading candidate for the Republican nomination. I know you don't do politics, but you've got to... I I'd like to ask you to comment on the foreign policy implications of this. This is Donald Trump claiming that he could solve the Ukraine war in a matter of one day. Let's watch. I know Zelensky very well, and I know Putin very well, even better. And I had a good relationship, very good, with both of them. I would tell Zelensky, no more. You got to make a deal. I would tell Putin, if you don't make a deal, we're going to give them a lot. We're going to give them more than they ever got if we have to. I will have the deal done in one day, one day. That was just yesterday on Fox News. Well, again, I, I obviously can't get into politics, and I won't. But not do as that. a candidate, but as a uh, I would just tell foreign you that, policy statement. I would just tell you that President Biden uh, knows how difficult this war has been for Ukraine, for the Ukrainian people. And he knows how difficult it has been for everybody trying to support Ukraine, because it has required sacrifices from 50-some-odd countries. And he has put a real premium on keeping unity in NATO, keeping unity within that broader coalition. And you saw that on display in Vilnius at the NATO summit. This is hard work, and wars are difficult. And we've got to make sure that we don't lose focus on making sure Ukraine can succeed on the battlefield so that if and when President Zelensky, and only he gets to determine 
when this is, when he's ready to sit down with Mr. Putin and, ha and have a negotiation, that he can do so from a position of strength. Now, I want to ask you about what's happening in the Senate, Senate and the House, but in the Senate with uh, Senator Tuberville, first of all, yeah. on, on holding up all of these positions in the Pentagon. And now you've got also the Secretary of State speaking out about State Department ambassadors who are being held up. Most, most of them, all but three, are career yeah. ambassadors are being held up yeah. by Ron Paul. So how is this affecting military families? You are a military family going back generations and yes. going forward. Yeah. You've got a, you know, two sons, son-in-law on, on destroyers right yes. now as we speak. Um, when people can't plan their lives, not just readiness, but recruitment. Yeah. And people can't rotate out, so they can't rotate in, and kids going to school. I, I had a chance. Here? I had a chance a couple of weeks ago to sit down with some military spouses. Uh, some were actually active duty members, uh, married to active duty members, and they were all women. Uh, and we talked about the, the impact of some of these states' laws on abortion, and it's having a real impact on their decision making about whether they're going to be willing to stay in the service or whether they want their spouse to stay in the service. They don't get to decide where they get assigned. You, you talked about my son and son-in-law. They're in Norfolk right now on, on uh, two different ships. That wasn't their choice. The Navy sent them there. That's what you do when you sign up to wear the uniform of the nation. Um, and so if you're in a state where you can't have access to reproductive care, you want to know that the Department of Defense has got your back and they're willing to provide a way for you to get that necessary re reproductive care. It has retention consequences without question. And then just take the broader issue of Senator Tuberville's holds. We're talking about 260 admirals and generals. Now, that might not sound like a lot to people, and you might think, well, admirals and generals are just admirals and generals. But as you rightly noted, it has a ripple effect down the chain of command. And now you're going to have dozens of families underneath each of those who can't make school decisions for their kids. They can't buy or rent new houses. They can't make the kinds of plans to move their families to a new city or a new part of the country, um, and it just freezes everything. Again, that's going to have an effect on some of these officers and their willingness to continue serving. So the that country. affects national security. No question. I mean, look at the things we've been talking about, the war in Ukraine. Look at the tensions in the Indo-Pacific. We've got John Kerry over there as a special envoy for climate meeting in Beijing. There's a lot of stuff going on national security-wise in the world. And when you don't have leaders in their appropriate assignments, confirmed by the Senate and with all the authorities they need to conduct those jobs, there's absolutely going to be a national security Quick question about China. Because even as John Kerry is now in China, following up on Yellen, following up on Blinken, is there chance despite everything that's happened with China, that Xi and Blinken and, excuse me, President Biden will speak, even as, you know, our Commerce Secretary is supposed to go and her emails, unclassified emails, were hacked in, in that large hack. Well, two things there. On the, on the call, there, absolutely, President Biden expects to have a conversation with President Xi sometime in the future. And I don't have anything on the schedule right to speak to, but he has said himself he's going to do it, and he'll do that. We'll do it at the appropriate time. He's glad that these... Uh, these visits are happening and these lines of communication are staying open. Now, on the hack, we found it. We alerted Microsoft. We did some things to try to shut down our vulnerability on that. We're being careful on attribution right now. We have no reason to doubt Microsoft's assertion that it came from Chinese hacking groups. Uh, we're going to make sure we can hold them accountable as appropriate. John Kirby on all things. It's great to see you in person. Thank you, you so much for being Thanks here. Thanks for having me, Andrew. And